In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. Today's gospel, the parable of the king, is famous. We've heard it many times, and we think we know the meaning. It's rich in meaning, and we shouldn't take that meaning for granted. Every time a gospel is read, we should check to see if we're hearing it and feeling it in our heart and living it in our lives. And so this king settles accounts with his debtors, those who owe him. And a man owes him 10,000 talents. That's a lot of money. Can't pay it. The man forgives the debt. The king forgives the debt. And the man goes out and then finds a person who owes him what amounts to one, one million two hundred fifty thousandth of what he owed him, of what he owed, and throws the book at him. This is not just a simple math equation. This has a number of important layers of truth. The first is that God, of course, is the king, and all of us are indebted to him. We're indebted to him for all of the gifts he's given us, beginning with life and our talents, and that's why that particular denomination of money was chosen in this parable so that we would get it. And the forgiveness that God gives us every time we sin, every time we fall short of his glory, every time we squander what he has given us. The second truth is that while we often forget how much we are in debt to the Lord, we forget that we need to use those talents, that gift of forgiveness, his love for his glory, for his church. So often we become preoccupied and we let the time that we have given by God to pass without finding any time for him in our lives. Not enough time to pray. Sometimes not enough time to go to church. Sometimes not enough time to work for the church. Our talent we forget that we need to share and use it for God's glory, whether it's singing or teaching, financial stewardship, care of the grounds, making pirohi, whatever our talents are. We owe the Lord. And thirdly, we owe the people of God in our richness, to take care of those in need. Those talents, those gifts, that, that wealth that we might have, as small as it might be. Remember the woman with just two coins? We need to share it. There are people less wealthy, people less guilt gifted, people who are in need because they're elderly and can't drive or elderly and can't cut the grass or elderly and can't come to church. We need to bring the church to them, either in person or not now maybe, but certainly by phone. Do we do those things? 
This gospel reminds us we fall short and we have to ask the king to forgive our debts, to forgive our sins, to forgive us. And he does that on one condition. He forgives us as we forgive others. There is no limit to his, to his compassion, to his mercy, to his love. Nothing limits that but our unwillingness to forgive others. If we do not forgive others, we will not be forgiven, the gospel says. The Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses, how as we forgive those who trespass against us. And so we must be about forgiveness. That's what Christianity is about. No other religion has that as its strong suit. There are cultures in which religion is warlike. Christianity is about forgiveness. But not human forgiveness, see? We can't say, I'll forgive you, but I won't forget, because that's not how God forgives. We can't say, I'll forgive you, but I want no part of you anymore. That's not how God forgives us. I can't say, I'll forgive you, but this is what you have to do. God's forgiveness is absolute. God's forgiveness is without limit. There are those who would say, yes, but you know, so-and-so did this to me. How could I possibly forgive him? If we go to the icon of Christ and we confess our sins, just for a week, our anger, our doubts, words we might have said that hurt someone, an untruth we might have told, a judgment we might have passed, an unkind word we might have said, he still forgives again and again and again. Peter asked him how many times should we forgive, Lord, seven times? Seven is the perfect number. But the Lord didn't take that number. He said, no, seven times, 70 times. Seven times seven. He took 10, the number that symbolized making something infinite and made forgiveness without limit. And made forgiveness without limit. Because every time we come to him in our prayers or in confession and ask for forgiveness, it's there as long as we don't withhold it from others. It's so important in Christianity that it's the key to understanding perhaps the hardest thing we have to do, which is love our enemies. How do you love your enemy? You begin by making him not your enemy. Now, this is how it doesn't work. There was a man who was being interviewed on his 90th birthday. And he talked about his friends. He said, I, and I don't have any enemies. And the interviewer was saying, that's a wonderful thing. What's the key? How did you do that? And he said, I outlive them all. It's not what I have in mind here. Or the mafia man who told the priest as, he was, as the man was dying and making his last confession, the priest said, do you have any enemies? And he said, no, Father. I shot them all. No. No, we don't want that. We want 
Something like Abraham Lincoln said once. He told the woman he was speaking to that he didn't have any enemies because with faith and love he turned them all into his friends. He turned them all into his friends. Forgiveness has that power. The power to change good into evil. To turn hate into love. To turn sin into salvation. We need to make use of that power. We need to forgive. And when we make that a lifestyle, it's miraculous. Forgiveness is a miracle for the person who gives it and the person who receives it. There's a story in a foreign country of a nurse who made a serious mistake one day on duty and a person died. And she probably would have been fired, but like The debtor in today's gospel, she begged for a second chance. And they gave it to her. And she worked as hard as she could and became the head of that hospital and one of the most honored nurses in her country. The power of being forgiven. My second parish, before I was the dean of the seminary, was in the Philadelphia area. There's a famous story of a a Korean exchange student who was killed senselessly and brutally by a group of boys because he was Korean, probably. From across the sea, This is how his parents, who were Christians, reacted. They said that while our hearts are breaking for the loss of our son, we know that more violence and more death is not the answer. So we appealed to the law officials of America to be as kind and gentle and forgiving to those young boys as Christ would want them to be. And they sent, this is a long time ago, but they sent $500 to the city of Philadelphia to establish a fund in his memory. At that time, that was five months' salary in Korea. Matushka knows how low salaries are in Ukraine today. So they don't realize it. We don't realize how good we have it financially. That example ignited Philadelphia. They raised $1.2 million to establish social work improvement for young people in the streets of the city. And scholarships were established for Korean students to come and study in their schools. The power of forgiving. The power of forgiving. We have to remember, my friends, that the Lord who loves us and forgives us tells us to be forgiven, we must forgive. That's his teaching. That's the code that unlocks the secret of his forgiveness. Some of you lived through the transition from dialing locally and using an operator to connect you long distance 
And then they came up with area codes. The area code connects you everywhere. In everything. Forgiveness is the code. St. Paul puts it this way in his epistle to the Ephesians. Put aside all bitterness and wrath, clamor and anger and slander, along with malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, and forgive others as you have been forgiven by God in Christ Jesus. Think about it. How many divorces could have been stopped if there was forgiveness? How many ulcers or heart attacks would have been prevented if people for, could forgive and let go? How many parent and child relationships would be healed if there was that tender-heartedness that Paul speaks of? How much violence in the streets could be avoided if people could forgive? If we forgive others, my friends, we will surely know without limit the forgiveness of the God who loves us more than we love ourselves. To him be all glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit and to ages of ages. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to I take this time to share with you this liturgy as limited as our abilities are right now, and to thank you for your love for your church, your stewardship for your church, your work for your church in the midst of this pandemic. I said when this began that we have to have the church pray for us and take care of us in the trials of this pandemic. But we have to make sure by our love and our labors, our generosity and our hard work that our church is still here when the pandemic is over. And so I thank you for all that you've done to follow that formula. When David writes in the Psalms, put not your trust in princes or sons of men, it should be pretty clear. With all due respect to everyone including myself. None of us, none of us human beings, bishops or politicians, scientists or doctors, know everything about this pandemic. And so our solutions are shifting like the sands of the sea. We're trying, but we make mistakes. The secret to the equation is to put the Lord into it. And unless we do that here and in our lives, in this church and in our icon corner, the world is not going to do it for us. 
you've seen the way the world has reacted to this. How many people have said, let's pray. You'll hear my prayer list in the litany. Every weekend we pray for you publicly, whatever church we're in. And every day I pray for you all. Your sick list, your departed list. We have to put the Lord into this equation and keep him there. We can't put our trust in princes or sons of men in whom there is no salvation. We let him change the hearts and the minds of others, of all of us, and we'll see his glory, his power, and his love. I urge you to remember that. And when you have doubts, this quote from Isaiah is so important. The Lord said to the prophet, and the prophet is one who speaks to us, for us. The Lord said, I will never forget you or forsake you. Because I have created you, I have carved you on the very palm of my hand. Thank you again for the strength of your faith, the love of your church, and your work for one another.